You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, December 8th, 2020. We share local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. My guest today is Davis Mayor Gloria Partida, and we'll get to that interview in just a few minutes. But first, some local news. Last week in our interview with Dr. Amy Sisson of Yolo County Public Health, we conjectured about the state's forthcoming shelter-in-place order, and sure enough, that went into effect last week, with Yolo County preemptively enacting its own order a couple of days prior. In short, the order directs us to stay home as much as possible, noting that activities that bring individuals into contact with people who are not household members do pose a risk of virus transmission, even if masks are worn. The order also details what critical infrastructure is, what businesses may remain open at what level, and and so on. It's a lot of info. You can find the complete order under the COVID Resources Spotlight at yolocounty.org. And also there, you'll find the new vaccine information page the county has set up. So speaking of vaccines for COVID, the world watched this morning as the United Kingdom began vaccinating vaccinating its citizens was kind of exciting to see a 90-year-old woman be the first to receive the vaccine. As discussed with Dr. Sisson last week, there's cause for optimism as several vaccines clear regulatory hoops and are readied for the American market. But according to a report in the Washington Post yesterday, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals has told the Trump administration it cannot provide substantial additional doses of its vaccine until late June or July because other countries have rushed to buy up most of its supply. This really makes me question what one person is telling the next and are we playing a game of telephone here? But what that may mean is that the U.S. government may not be able to ramp up as rapidly as it had expected from the 100 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine it already purchased earlier this year. Raising questions about whether we can keep to an aggressive schedule to vaccinate most Americans by late spring or early summer. Uh, We'll keep you posted on that. Meanwhile, more opportunities for saliva-based COVID-19 testing in Davis became available this week. Anyone who's had the test with the nasal swab will tell you this is a good thing. Testing via Healthy Davis Together in December is available at two locations. The first is the Davis Senior Center at 646 A Street, and the second, the Mondavi Center, uh, at the UC Davis campus, 523 Merak Hall Drive. This testing is offered to anyone who lives or works in Davis, but is limited to asymptomatic individuals only. For more information, including testing times, dates, and appointments, uh, visit healthydavistogether.org slash testing. And as we are in December and dealing with some mighty cold nights, I wanted to note that the Yolo County uh, COVID-19 Eviction Prevention Ordinance and the COVID-19 Emergency Rental Assistance Grant Program remain in effect for low-income residents across the county. The ordinance stops many residential and commercial evictions related to COVID-19 impacts and will remain in effect for 180 days after the public health and local emergencies are terminated. And of course, all of that is still very much in effect. To receive receive eviction protection under the ordinance, tenants must be experiencing substantial loss of income due to COVID-19, substantial out-of-pocket medical expenses resulting from the virus, uh, or compliance with a lease term that would violate a state or local requirement. Basically, the Rental Assistance Program provides a one-time rent and utilities grant to low-income Yolo County tenants who have been unable to pay full rent because they've experienced and can demonstrate hardships. There are so many, many stipulations around both this ordinance and this funding, and a frequently asked questions document is available on the county website under the Local Assistant tab at yolocounty.org. We're going to take a moment for music, and we'll be back with the mayor in just just a minute. All right, my guest today is Davis City Council member and current mayor, Gloria Partida, elected to council in 2018. I remember interviewing Gloria back then about her concerns that the same reasons she was running, equity, inclusion, advocacy, were perhaps not electable issues. 
That clearly turned out not to be the case as she became our community's first Latinx mayor and has continued to advocate for those issues and more. It's my pleasure to welcome you today, Gloria. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm always pleased to um, uh, have the opportunity to visit with you, Autumn. Oh, thank you. You know, it was just over a month ago, we uh, we hung out for a bit on Zoom as co-hosts during the live election night show here at Davis Media Access. I remember we spoke very briefly then about how the pandemic has impacted the city, but I know there's just layers and layers of stuff there. So tell us a little bit about the job of helping to govern the city at this moment in time. Um, what have been some of the most visible impacts in terms of day-to-day governance, and how has your work on council been affected? Sure. So um, I would say that the most visible um, effects of the pandemic is really just the very vacant uh, downtown area and the lack of students. We're usually about this time of year, um, you know, seeing students leave, but there hasn't been a real uh, difference in you know, the, the summer, the sort of quietness we get over the summer when students are out of town, and then you can really feel kind of the vibrancy of the city return right. with the students. And um, so that, of course, uh, affects the amount of business that happens not only downtown but throughout the city. And, you know, of course, we've had uh, the challenges uh, of hotel occupancy and and leases really yeah. you know, having having our apartments filled. We've never had a vacancy rate which is this low and that is challenging for everyone. Um, and of course, you know, comes back to to affect the city budget and we have to be very careful in how we proceed forward. We had at the beginning of the pandemic um, instituted a lot of of furloughs and cuts in uh, projects uh, or, you know, put off a bunch of projects that we had um, intended to do. And we are still in a wait and see mode because we don't know uh, the full effect of, you know, when this current surge is is going to be over uh, and, you know, what will, where we will end up financially when it's when it is all over. Uh, so yeah. we're very, very cautious. Cities are in such a difficult position right now. Um, you know, you've mentioned some of the uh, the occupancy issues, the business struggling, and I, I it's really impacting our, our restaurants severely. Um, it, you know, and they, they can open and then they have to close and they can open and they close. And we all understand why the, the public health orders are, are in place, but it doesn't make it any easier. You, you touched on two things I want to explore a little bit more, and that was a, a loss of sales tax from businesses and then uh, the transient occupancy tax, which I know the city of Davis uses to fund um, a lot of things. I'm most familiar from it with my work with Arts Alliance and how it has funded arts and culture projects. Um, so how, how is info about the, the potential shortfalls um, from the state? How is all of that communicated to the city? What, what is, what's the line of communication there? Shortfalls from the state, you mean um, as far as revenue goes? Yeah. Or mm-hmm. um, so reporting, you mean, like uh, mm-hmm. for, the, for the taxes? Yes, so we get that on a regular basis, um, usually uh, very late in the fall. And I know that we just got, we just had our report out recently. And um, I think that, you know, of course we were low, but we were not as low as as we thought that we were going to be, Mm -hmm. Um, at least not in, in the city of Davis. But as I said, we can, we're, we're still, uh, you know, waiting for for the for the full effect of all of that. Yeah, it's kind of waiting for that other shoe to drop. <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. 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 So uh, we did give we did give the hotels a pass, in, uh, you know, initially for the for them having to um, to pay their uh, their their transient 
occupancy tax, mm-hmm. but it wasn't a forgiveness, and so we do, um, you know, think that we will recoup some of that. Of course, not mm-hmm. very much because they they couldn't take any any um, occupants for right. a while there. Right. Yeah, that's another industry that's been heavily um, impacted. I wanted to check in with you. Uh, you know, over the years, I, I've worked a lot with many city staff members, and I know the, the city staff has been weathering furloughs. So how how is uh, how are things at, at City Hall, and what kind of uh, projects have been, had to have been deferred um, simply because employees have been furloughed or cut back? So the, the projects that have been deferred have mostly been the capital improvement projects. And so we kind of we did like a rating system for things that, that could be put off um, until later, things that uh, needed to be done right away, needed to be fixed right away. Uh, those, those were the ones that we put forward. Things like, um, you know, uh, for instance, there was a conversation around a bicycle pump track, and mm-hmm. that was already kind of on the back burner because there, you know, it was it was really one of those nice to have um, things and not a need to have things. So even before all of this happened, it was it was um, you know there was a question of when that was going to happen, and, sure. and it wasn't a priority. But then, you know, you have uh, you know we have to seal the streets so that they don't. Uh, continue to to deteriorate, and uh, those sorts of projects were the ones that went forward. Uh, infrastructure that needed to be updated or or you know kept kept up so that so that there wasn't there weren't safety issues. Those sorts of projects, right, right, uh, were prioritized. Yeah, you know, you and I live just a uh, you know maybe five, six blocks from each other. And there's been a lot of that work in, in our area. They were, uh, they were out sealing the cracks kind of for the second time, I think, uh, preparatory to a, a slurry seal and all of that. So it is good to see that, that happening. Um, and it makes sense to do it at a time when perhaps there's less traffic on the streets and things like that, too. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Unfortunately, with the slurry seal, they did seal the cracks, but um, the slurry seal, the weather changed. And um, it, you know, you need a certain temperature for mm. that to set, and so we're now waiting on on for the for the rest of that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it got cold. It got really cold. It did. Yeah. It did. It did. Um, but anyway, there. As I said, it it's kind of I think a little. Um, um, I think people sometimes feel like they they're not sure what's going on because some things come from grant money and not the general fund, right. and so they may see projects that are going forward or that um, are still being worked on, and people may think, well, you know, why are, why are we doing that yeah. if there's no money? But, they're, you know, people always forget that there are different pots <laughs> of Rest- money. Restricted funds, right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, Gloria, w- what do you hear about most from constituents? And, and this could be, I mean, there's public comment, which we all have access to, but I, I imagine people talk to you all the time. What's on everyone's minds? What's the thing you hear most frequently about? It, you know, it really depends on uh, what month you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and even, like, what week you ask me that question. <laughs> um, but I would say that what has emerged and has been um, a, a pretty steady stream of concern recently is the um, is rising crime, hmm. and uh, that you know there you know we just got the statistics on that, and there is a increase in crime. It is not you know just in the city of Davis. It, it is statewide, um, but I think that you know sometimes. Uh, things take up a life of their own, and so um, sometimes these issues can be amplified uh, just by, you know, next door, things like next door, and mm-hmm. you know, other social media outlets where, you know, people begin to, you know, the chatter starts and then it amplifies. Um, that's not to dismiss the fact that there are real uh, issues that are happening for people, and, you know, when you have 
your business uh, broken into or your car broken into, it's a real thing. And it's, you know, it's always very stressful for people and traumatizing. So I, you know, I don't want to give the impression that I'm dismissing it at all. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I, I, I do think that it's, um, you know, the increase is not, um, you know, as, as bad as it is in, in other places. And uh, with, um, with our uh, also challenge of, of continuing to recruit police officers, sometimes, it, you know, it's, a, it's hard to, to keep the, the level of patrol up. Yeah. And it's kind of an interesting um, thing to be happening right now when we're having um, so many discussions around reimagining police. Right, and right. so I probably hear equal amounts of get rid of the police and, you know, you need more police. Yeah. <laughs> right, and, and of course, you know, it's not just COVID we're dealing with this time, but it's been the the whole, just a whole lot of social and, and political foment. Um, and here in Davis, as you mentioned, there's there's been this the huge focus on police accountability. So I know that the, the city has just completed a process of council appointments. I know that you and Council Member Carson are the, the subcommittee that, you know, vets people for those. And I'm just going to say that the community was um, highly engaged with the process this time <laughs> around. Um, there's an event on December 14th about the nine recommendations submitted by the Public Health and Safety Joint Subcommittee to the Davis City Council. I'm um, hoping you will tell us more about the, the process, kind of, and what, what led to this event. Sure. So this uh, process started way back in the summer uh, after the George Floyd incident. And, um, and so this was when, you know, most of the nation started the conversation around defunding the police. Yeah. And there were many cities that came forward almost immediately and said, you know, we're cutting our police department by uh, 20%, 5%, you mm -hmm. know, threw out a number there. And I know that there were many citizens that were disappointed because we were talking about our, the budget at that time, so it would have made sense if we said, okay, we're talking about the budget, let's cut the police budget by a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. And um, and I felt like there, you know, we would get a great headline, like a lot of other cities um, receive, by saying, you know, making a very definitive, um, quick uh, decision, but it wasn't really, they wouldn't have really been very meaningful, I felt, because we don't know where, we didn't know at that point, you know, where we needed to make changes in the police department mm -hmm. or in policing that would be most effective for us. There are other cities, all cities have a different, a different dynamics and different issues, and what would have worked in another city might not necessarily have worked for us. Mm -hmm. So we wanted that uh, process to be much more thoughtful. We wanted to engage the community. Uh, it's one of those things where you know people want you to do things quickly, um, but they want you to also give the, com the community an opportunity to, to weigh in. Mm -hmm. And you can't do both of those things. <laughs> not gracefully <Right>. anyway. <laughs> no, no. And, and also, I mean, we're a community that, as you said, is highly engaged. Yeah. But it's the exact same people that are highly engaged all the time. Yes. So if you really want to bring all the voices into the conversation, it takes a little more work because the people that speak up um, always speak up. Mm -hmm. And so you always get the same viewpoints. You always get the same viewpoints from the people who have the most agency already. And so um, I was really pleased that we did this process. And I sat in on a lot of that, um, uh, uh, those conversations with the tri-joint commission, mm -hmm. the three commissions that were put together. And there, were, there was a lot of public comment that, that um, happened in, in those, at, at that, 
you know, in those com- in those meetings. Yeah. Um, but again, it was the same people that we heard from in um, in the uh, city council. Uh, yeah. You know. So, so the event on the fourteenth, I noticed it's it's sponsored by maybe not the usual suspects when we think about uh, city politics. Indivisible Yolo, ACLU, Yolo Chapter, Davis Phoenix Coalition, and Yolo People Power. So that's kind of a nice uh, cross section of people, and I imagine that was deliberate based on what you're saying. Yes, yes. So, and and um, this that particular meeting on the 14th was um, it was spearheaded by Yolo People Power, mm-hmm. and so it's great that they are doing that outreach and engaging you know, the um, areas of the community that, as I said, are, are typically not engaged. Right. Uh, so, and I think that the hope for that particular meeting is just to get the, the information on the report out mm-hmm. so that people understand what the recommendations are from, from the commission and to also give input around the... Um, the recommendations that, that came out, like to to understand how people are are feeling about those right. uh, recommendations, how we how we got there essentially, right. and then those recommendations go to the full council, and when will the council vote on those? Uh, so it's more it's not necessarily a vote mm-hmm. of you know on the recommendations. Uh, you know, yes, we're going to accept all of these recommendations, or we agree with three of these recommendations. Um, I think that some of that will go forward, but it's, I, we will give our input back to staff and go forward with uh, collecting what we need, uh, what the city needs to implement some of those recommendations. So, uh, for instance, one of the recommendations is um, uh, developing a crisis now model we would need information about what that would look like, what, you know, all the, all the necessary um, structure around that is, you know, uh, trying to figure out what's needed for the structure. Uh, we would have to coordinate with um, the, the county on some of the recommendations. We'd have to figure out, like, how to fund uh, the recommendations. And so there's, there has to be a, a more robust um, um, you know, betting and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and information that has to come back. Right. And so, and this is why we put this off. So this conversation, this particular agenda item started on the 1st, and, uh, geez, what did we have? 153 commenters. That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> which, which took most of the evening and... Um, you know, Brett and his wisdom said, let's not take up the discussion at 1.30 in the morning, yeah. um, which was a good call. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so we are, it's a continuation uh, of that conversation that started on the 1st. And so what will happen on the 15th is that we will open that agenda item and, at, um, at the discussion portion. Right. So we won't take more public comment. <laughs> All the 15th. Good to uh, know. Which is a, which is a good thing. <laughs> as, as I said at the top of the interview, layers upon layers of, of work and understanding how yeah. city government works, how the council works. Gloria, we're about out of time. We've got about another minute and a half. So I just okay. anything, uh, any parting thoughts for us, anything else you wanted to communicate? I would like to communicate to people to be safe. Uh, we are really uh, in a very bad time right now with COVID, and um, and so I know I know it's it's tough already, um, but I I really am encouraging everyone to um, you know be as safe as possible. And in, in if you don't need to go out, don't go out. Um, yep. And make sure to wear your mask. <laughs> Sound advice. Thank you so much for your time, for always making yourself accessible, and for your service. And I do wish you happy holidays. You as well. All right. Thank you for having me. Take good care, Gloria. Bye.
You know, my pleasure during this show is always learning so much about how people do the work of governing, running a business, teaching, whatever it is they do. Thanks so much for tuning in. You've been listening to the COVID-19 Community Report from the KDRT Studio.